welcome to this uh, special Zoom session that has actually been uh, assembled by, and I owe all the credit to Dr. Lauren Collier, who is now with Vantage Point Inc. And uh, she's going to pick up where we left off in our conversation with MC. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, can go to our archives and watch the MC program on the use of big data in making decisions about curriculum and uh, career development and helping our students uh, think more strategically about choosing their major and what that's going to be. And so today's program is going to go into the pragmatics and uh, some products <clears throat> that can be very useful to our campuses. So with that, uh, Lauren, I'm going to give you the screen and let you uh, introduce a topic and you and Travis take us from there. Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces for sure. I think I know all of you, um, obviously, most recently from THEC. Um, but made the jump, some of you may know, others may not, made the jump in January to vantage point. Um, and I want to take a second to introduce my, my colleague, Travis Mantiply, um, who has been part of Vantage Point and helped conceive of and build the things that we're going to walk through today. So for our purposes today, he's going to be our tour director. Um, so jumping right in. Um, all right. So just a quick um, Really my intent today is to share with you some of the new ways that of approaching some of these big, messy human problems um, that higher education is up against. Um, and what I'm learning being at vantage point in terms of technology and data, but even more than that, how do we make data speak the language of the people that we're trying to communicate with? Um, one of the, the quotes that really resonated with me during the last, the IT presentation from Elucian was that I don't need to speak technology, but I need technology that speaks my language. And so the, uh, the approach that Vantage Point takes to using data and technology to speak this language. Um, Vantage Point is a technology consulting company. Um, but very mission oriented and has developed a niche in this post-secondary space, starting first with a military and adult learner contracts and then expanding beyond that. Um, and that is really what spoke to me and why it's been fun for me to learn some new skills. And um, I know the, the, the Tennessee Higher Education Innovation and Leadership Fellows Program, that innovation piece is really and fundamental for me. So an opportunity there. So the bottom line for all of us, I think, in higher education right now, our big fundamental challenge is this. We see what it takes to live and work and succeed in our world right now. And we know that the knowledge economy, the jobs that are required, really necessitate skills and education. We also know that the very people we need to reach to engage in those post-secondary um, opportunities are the ones that have the least exposure to it and that see these choices, this sort of mess of choices and costs and time and, and frequently just don't see themselves as a fit there. So our two big questions, one, um, how do we identify the pathways? What are the jobs that we need now and that we're going to need in the future. Um, what are the pathways to get there? So the data, and if you look at this slide, a lot of this data has existed for a while. I knew that this was, uh, this was available and some of the things that I encountered when I was sitting at Vol State or at THEC, looking at P20 data, looking at academic uh, program inventories, looking at economic development and labor outlook data. The challenge was, they didn't really connect. So when you were trying to make decisions, those pieces were sort of disconnected and disparate and also pretty time limited. You know, you had an annual report and then you waited a year and you tried to see if you could line up those dots a year later. What's different now 
and this is where the MC connection comes in, is these large national data sets like MC and Burning Glass that are scrubbing these postings, the job postings, the earnings data, um, they then provide us with um, what we can distill down into skills. And skills then become this cellular or atomic level that help us to connect the dots. Um, they help us to connect across education. So K-12 can talk about the same skills that we talk about in post-secondary. We can bridge the gaps between some of our post-secondary entities. So kind of getting out of these, um, you know, course hours to contact hours, some of these, these constraints that our data has, has had historically. And the next piece is it allows to bridge us all the way to our, our jobs and to begin to validate that learning based on how real workers are performing in their jobs. So skills then become this fundamental building block that we can use to, to begin to piece together the data. So putting all of that in one place is great. But it, it might inform us as leaders as we try to chart our course, but frankly, it's, it's not very user friendly and it's certainly not something that is digestible to our average students and families. So the next piece of this is, okay, how do we then slice and dice this? How do we make this useful for the people that we're trying to reach? Um, and Vantage Point is typically the technology partner that sits down with the funding entities, whether those are state or federal agencies or institutions, and identifies what the problem is that we're trying to solve. What piece is it that we want to focus on? Then you take that and think through what are the different data elements or pieces that we have that we can bring together to address that. And then finally, and I think this is not insignificant, well, how do we then represent that so it speaks the language of the people that we're trying to reach? Um, I, I confess, I did not know what a human-centered designer was, um, but this approach has been really exciting to get into the minds of the people we're trying to reach and have that be part of the technical design piece. So you'll see that the tools that we demonstrate here in a minute look different because they have different audiences and that's on purpose. So what does this look like in practical terms? So let's, let's take Nikki. Um, Nikki is a high school student at Sevier County High School. Um, she lives with her mother and her sister, um, is eligible for, for Pell, Pell Grants. She's a good student, she runs track, she's working a job, but she really doesn't know what her next steps are. She's not quite sure what that might look like. Um, she has a goal of moving to Nashville maybe, but also recognizes she may need to stay closer to home as she considers the next options. So as higher ed folks, how do we set her up for success? How do we help her answer the questions and the concerns that she has? Um, with that, I'm going to uh, pass off to, to Travis and let him walk us through Mickey, Nikki's journey. Thank you. So Nikki's journey really begins at 14 or 15 years old when she first enters high school. And a counselor might introduce her to this application, which is called XP. Um, it's sort of a game, a game feel, gamey feel application. It's designed specifically for Gen Z. They like loud colors. They like simplicity. They don't like to be told. They like to explore on their own. And we want to begin to teach Nikki the value of skills and show her the activities she's participating in today are helping her gain skills. We also want her to understand how skills relate to the workforce, but most importantly, we want to broaden her horizons and her understanding of the labor market because we understand that many underserved in the underserved population don't have the peers in front of them, the family members to help them understand all that's available in the workforce. They just may get their information from uh, TikTok or uh, what they hear, you know, on social media. And so we want them to understand this. Um, so this begins with her exploring her skills wallet. And what we're gonna do is take her through 
a, a qu three quick surveys. One is, uh, let's, are you doing anything today? Do you have any jobs? Maybe are you babysitting? Um, and in this situation, we just said salon assistant. This is just a, a design, by the way. So you have to use your imagination a little bit with me. We're currently building this. Um, but, you know, based on your, your work experience, we know we've deconstructed that using MC Skills API, uh, which uh, skills are available for that particular occupation. And can you, why don't you just try to rate yourself against those skills and check the ones that you have gained. And then the next thing we're going to ask are, are you doing any after school activities? And so we also know information about the skills that you're going to gain in those after school activities. And could you also rate yourself against those skills? And then finally, uh, what's your favorite classes? What do you really enjoy? And we're also able to deconstruct those classes into skills. And then based on this information, we're going to present to her the concept of a skills wallet, uh, which is, hey, here's all of your skills listed A to Z, and you can browse through those. And then here's your skills that are actually top earning, and here's ones that are aligned with your interests. And I'll show you that in a minute. But based on your experiences, uh, your work and your activities and classes, these are the skills that you actually have and that you're gaining. And then importantly, let's begin to introduce you to pathways uh, which have skills that are similar to ones you're already learning. So hopefully this is a little bit of encouragement and also broadens her horizons. And then what we have the user do then is to sort of enter into a, a tender type uh, profile for pathways. Now, if you guys are used to tools, you'll, you're usually used to seeing, you know, interest surveys or surveys that produce one occupation or one job. What we're doing here is using MC's new um, career pathway API, which calculates the probability of uh, moving from one job to the next job. So you can pick any job in the world and they have the probability of the, this, the next jobs that would appear um, as far as you would like to go. And so we're just creating sort of four packs to make it consumable for the user and making it simple. And we're showing what the credential requirements are and, and salary and skills. And then so just with simple pictures, uh, Nikki will be able to say, hey, I like it or I love it. And we just say X or heart. And so she can go through here and she can like things and just simply go through card by card. And the next thing we want to introduce her is is her passions and we want we want Nikki to understand that you are valuable and you're needed in the workforce. Um, we understand that confidence tends to be a problem with the population that we're targeting here first gen or the underserved populations and we want to give them that confidence that they actually are needed. And so we're going to take Nikki through a quick interest survey and we also have some other surveys that uh, we're going to work through to help create a profile and help them identify uh, with a with a profile that makes sense to them. And so in this case, we're gonna show, hey, you know, you're know, you unique and you're, this is your prominent traits that we know about you. And based on your, you, people like you find these pathways to be interested. And so again, she can launch into the ability to explore. And she can also explore by category on her own at any time as she pleases, as you saw, in the, in the very beginning, there's uh, three tiles. So my passions, explore, and, um, and uh, skills wallet. Now, at any time, as she's exploring and there's things that she likes are collected here. And so she can view this collection and she sees the pathways that she's selected and she can look deeper into that pathway to understand uh, a little more about that uh, particular job openings, which with the MC data that we have, we can get very localized. So we can just speak about the state of Tennessee. I mean, we're out of Virginia, so a lot of our, uh, our work, you know, shows Virginia examples, but we can be very specific about Tennessee. And we can help Nikki begin to understand that this pathway requires you to achieve these skills. And to get these skills, this is how you need to prepare. Now, we understand that we can't solve every problem with Nikki, but if we can at least move the ball forward a little bit and get her to a counselor or a mentor, then we've done what we need to do. So we want to show her exactly what is the next thing you need to do to prepare. Um, that may be a course, that may be another after-school activity. 
And if she wants to look deeper into a particular occupation within a pathway, we provide her that capability as well. And we'll show her uh, credential requirements as well as occupation hotspots. And again, with the MC data, we can get very local down to the zip code level. And so we could just show the state of Tennessee here if we needed to. And of course, we, we, we highlight skills and other related occupations. But one thing that I didn't show you, and that's available on this design, is there's a fourth tile down here, which is mentoring. And this is something that's available for local communities. And based on her skills and her passions, we're able to match her with a mentor that can help guide her and maybe, um, maybe help move her along further in the process of, of discovering her future. And a mentor may help her understand, well, you know what? Based on your skills, based on your interest, these are actually the, have you considered maybe being a nurse? Have you considered nursing in any type? And with that, she may be empowered to visit her high school counselor. And the high school counselor may pull up another tool, which is, this is something called Return on College. And it's a return on investment modeling tool, uh, which uses MC, let's see, job posting and MC labor data uh, to help perform multivariate regression analysis um, along with, uh, we're also using, um, excuse me, iPads, Census, DLS, and other public data sources combined with that data um, to provide, to perform an analysis on her future options. And so the counselor may pull up this tool and say, okay, well, you know, you're 17, you've been a babysitter, you're tracking for your high school diploma, and you want to live in Nashville. Have you considered being a nursing aide? And with this particular occupation, you would need to get a certificate. And let's say you retire age 67, and you can attend TCAT Knoxville. Well, there's no tuition cost for you to attend in a TCAT Knoxville and achieve that certificate. It is gonna require time investment. You may have some books and other costs, um, but look at how this affects your earnings if you don't get that credential. If you stay with a high school diploma, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, if you wanna live in Nashville, well, the living expenses are estimated to be this, and you're gonna have much less disposable income compared if you just stay in your hometown and you, um, you, know, you just get a high school diploma. And so a counselor is able to discuss the concepts of lifetime earnings um, and the difference that you would have with one credential versus no credential and the concepts of return on investment. But she may also look at another model and say, well, have you considered maybe being a registered nurse and pursuing your bachelor's of science in nursing? Um, let's look at what that does for you. You know, you're going to have a little more cost here uh, because if you're going to attend East Tennessee State University and take, let's say, four years to achieve that, it's going to cost you a little bit more money. Um, but your return on investment is going to be 8.9%. And, and the counselor can explain the concept of return on investment to her. But also, she's going to see a dramatic difference in her salary and her earnings and really show her that with this credential, your upward mobility prospects are much greater than if you just continue where you are with no, with no degree. And so it's visual and she can explain that. Now, what the counselor may suggest is, why don't you go home and talk with your mother and why don't you visit that institution's website and look at this nursing degree? And then why don't you uh, take a look at your net price? And she can under, uh, explain what a net price is, how much you're actually going to have to pay based on your family's income. And so this is another return on college product, which is available for the, its institution specific. What I, the one I just showed you is free and it's available for anyone to use, any counselor. Uh, for, it's free for counseling. Uh, but this one is for, for schools and institutions. And here, uh, Nikki could come in with her mother and fill out some information similar to what, she, what the counselor filled out in return on college. And she's looking at this specific degree, and then she can get an idea of what her net price is going to be. This is sort of a net price calculator 2.0, and she can model different careers that she may be interested in against that credential and then see how that would affect her monthly budget outlook. Hey, if you invest this much money in your education, um, this is what your student loan payment is going to be, and this is what your disposable income looks like. So it's a practical discussion between a family and a potential a prospective student. And we can look at this within one year, five years, and 10 years. 
but overall, we're still showing the concept of a return on investment. And then finally, let's look at this from another angle. Let's say that Nikki wants to explore on her own and she visits an institution's homepage. And what you're looking at here is something called the Career Accelerated Toolkit, which is a two plus two agreement between Northern Virginia Community College and George Mason. It's analogous to Tennessee's Transfer Pathways, um, except Virginia doesn't have a tuition-free community college. And so here, Nikki could come in and say, all right, you know what? I, let me just see, let me just take a look at their nursing degrees. And she could come down here and take a look at their BSN in nursing. And she sees right away that within this pathway, I'm also going to earn an associate's degree. And she can get an idea of her course load. And we begin to introduce the concept of skills gained by courses. And so what we've done here is we're using actually burning glass data. We use burning glass skills and burning glass labor market APIs to build this along with the other public data sets that we've mentioned. And we surface the top skills. And what we mean by top skills, these are skills that are mentioned most in job postings. And we've deconstructed the college courses into skills. And so we begin to introduce that idea to her so she can think about her college in terms of skills. And we also show her the top skills that she's going to gain in this pathway. And she can view the definition of these if she doesn't understand what they may be. But most importantly, we show her her career opportunities with this pathway. And so in this case, maybe she's interested in being a clinical nurse. Maybe she didn't know that was something that existed. And here we use that burning glass labor market information API uh, to show her some simple facts that may be important to her, such as the career growth or the salary or the 10 year projected job openings. And we also show her the pathways and how she and that are available to help her enter into this um, into this career. But most importantly, you begin to introduce the concept of a skills roadmap. And that is, we've deconstructed not only the courses into skills, but we've deconstructed the occupation or the career uh, field of interest into skills. And so we know what skills are required within that occupation. And so what we've done is matched the skills that you acquire uh, from your courses with those occupations and crosswalk them so that now we can map those skills over the course of, let's just say she does four years of school within this pathway. And we can show how she'll gain those. And we also have information on companies that are hiring. And again, you see some of this zip code level uh, um, uh, labor market information or salary information, um, but in this case, we show national. And then let's say Nikki decides that she wants to enroll and she wants to pursue this pathway. And so what we offer her is the ability to track her milestones between two institutions. Since she's this pathway, this particular program offers dual enrollment. So uh, it's kind of confusing to manage between two institutions what you need to do. So we keep track of those milestones for her and she can just come in here and say, uh, yes, I've completed that. She can also do some course planning. And this is a breakdown of the course map and requirements by institution. You see Nova and Mason, and she can see what she needs to take. And she can just come in here and she can decide that she wants to take uh, this course and this course and, and choose when she plans to take it. And she can do some course planning and also talk about this with the counselor. Counselors have the exact same view into her record here, so they can have a conversation around the same data. And as she plans her skills, or excuse me, as she plans her courses, those skills will populate across this continuum, this time continuum. It may be four years, and, and some schools like to do it by credit hour blocks, so because not everybody graduates in four years, some take six years. And as she completes courses, she can simply mark these as complete, or we have APIs to the university that we're working through, which will just mark the courses complete for her, so she doesn't have to worry about that. But as she completes courses, uh, she sees the skills that she's completed and gained. And this will hopefully encourage persistence. And additionally, at the whole time, she's keeping in view of the pathways that she's getting ready for. And then finally, the last thing I'll show you is that as she completes skills or courses, those skills transfer to a skills transcript. And here she can write about the skills she's gained by course, and she can keep notes about um, what she's learned and why that was important. And if she needs help understanding what that skill was again, she can always view the definition to help her write uh, some information uh, about this skill and what she learned. 
and she can print this out and take it with her. And when, she, when it comes time to have an interview with an employer, now she's able to speak more intelligently about her coursework, hopefully advertise herself better and, uh, and stand out from her peers as she can speak better about what she's learned and how that relates to the employer because the skills that she's gained are the skills that they need. So I'll stop right there. Um, Lauren, back over to you. <laughs> um, so we, we did a flyover approach here on purpose um, to, to show kind of how some of this data is used in a very practical way. Um, we, we've got mostly tech folks here, but I do want to, to kind of toss out some of my impressions and see what jumps out at you. So, for example, uh, when I first saw the advanced tool, um, what crossed my mind is, I know the practical implementation of the Tennessee transfer pathways. We know what is legal and we know what happens in practice. And how amazing to have a tool that puts everybody on the same page so that you can really show and the student can advocate for themselves to make sure that they are getting the credits that they've earned. The other piece of this is the way that it's built. So a lot of the heavy lifting in clarifying these pathways happens on the back end using technology by matching those skills. But that is then passed off or given to faculty to review, to approve, they can edit, they can make changes. So for those of you who have lived like I have, trying to make that happen at a faculty level, you know, you're bringing your disciplinary folks from the community college and the university together, and you get kind of stuck there. The back end value of this for some of us is maybe almost as important as what it provides to students. Um, so I, I will toss that out um, there. Similarly, with uh, return on college, um, I know there is the student right to know bill that's uh, moving through the legislature now, but often where those get stuck and where it becomes really problematic for institutions is if there is a mandate about how you communicate your um, financial aid awards, that becomes a very heavy lift. Well, what if you have a tool like this that does it for you? <laughs> you get to the student has the ability to know and compare, um, but it doesn't require the institution to completely retool your your processes. Um, so, yeah, let me open the floor and back away and feel free to bring your your tech questions, your data questions, what have you. So I find this. Um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask. So is this information? something that can be used by any college or university or is this really specific to nova and the other four-year college uh, this is national data so uh we're just we're just working with uh, mason and nova they're in our backyard so for some of these right now but absolutely um this national tool here for return on college um, is currently being used in pennsylvania um, and we're also working with um, some counselors in Missouri. And so this is just national data. I just selected Tennessee uh, for the sake of this demonstration. So when you're in the, uh, the, the GMU advanced toolkit, is that within your application? Are you solely within the, your, the application? I'm just curious how that works. Are you actually on George Mason's website at that point? Oh, no, it just looks like that. Uh, our designers okay. have done a good job. Okay. <laughs> it says software as a service application. Okay. So uh, we don't store any student uh, PII uh, or information in our system. Um, we just store, uh, you know, the, the minimum data that we need um, to be able to uh, keep track of their uses within the application. Um, so a lot of this data is shared via API with Mason or through flat files from their systems. I see. The other thing I find interesting is, you know, I have two rising seniors, you know, and we're going on college tours and, uh, you know, I'm fortunate I live in Collierville, Tennessee, we go to a great school and they have career counseling and they still don't know what they want to do. 
so I do find this aspect very interesting because it really creates a, it creates self-awareness, I think, you know, for the student. And so, and, 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 and they can do it in real time and it appears like they could do it on their mobile device. You know, if they have to go to any other place to do it, they're not likely to do it, which I find interesting. I think that mobility is, is important. And the second thing I'll say is, you know, and I get this from students all the time is financial literacy. I mean, you got a tuition estimator that sits in one place, cost of attendance, which isn't, it's more than just tuition sits somewhere else. And then you have degree progress sits in another place. And this application looks like it can tie these things together. That's, that's correct. I was just showing you, um, sorry, the, you know, the, how it's responsive. This is a responsive website, but uh, that is correct. Um, there's some, there's some real benefits there. And, uh, you know, oops, looks like, I'm sorry, I'm in the de development environment. Looks like it's getting a little buggy on me. So uh, I can reload it. But yes, uh, it, uh, uh, degree planning, career planning, uh, as well as um, some career counseling, it, it does, it has ties into each of those. Um, Michael, one of the things that's interesting and that I'm still wrapping my head around is that these are essentially like a bunch of different building blocks that can be brought together in different configurations based on whatever it is that, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? So in this case, you know, we can sort of pull out, we've got the, um, the career piece, the interest piece, the financial piece. How do we want to fit those together? Um, it, you know, based on whatever the, the real use case is that you need to solve. Sure. Okay. Well, I'd like to piggyback on that. Um, so it sounds like you're the, the tech guy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so all of this is microservices. And uh, so we, we consider them Lego blocks. And we we're finding that many of the needs of states and institutions are similar. And so we're just reconstructing the same thing over and over again, just in a different way that meets their needs and their problems. So that's what we've done. We've just, you know, the ability to look at a pathway, the ability to uh, view specific data points are all available microservices. We can just restructure it as needed, and we can also uh, design as needed uh, for the end user. Um, and something that's also interesting, which I don't have a demo of, I wish I did, a lot of this data that we're using today, uh, we have a proposal with the state of Florida. We'll see how that pans out on Friday. Um, but basically, we are going to help them understand the supply and demand of credentials at the local level, particularly CTE credentials, um, as well as return on investment for credentials, um, and really help their policymakers make decisions or understand where they should make decisions um, regarding the administration of education in their state. Um, and that's available through just an analytics dashboard. So, you know, whereas this data is structured for users of different types, as you've seen in different applications, um, that is another example where, but it's more for policymakers. And so they want to just see a uh, to the point executive summary level um, visualizations. Well, as you know, in Tennessee, our legislature is really big on transparency. And in fact, you know, they've passed some laws recently when we were admitting undergraduates or you have to have a summary of their estimated costs over the a degree program, the course or the life of that degree program. I'm sure, Lauren, you are familiar with that as well. Right. And so we're always grappling with ways, how do we present this in a way that makes sense? But I, I, I want it to be more than just something you send to somebody and just sort of sits on a shelf just to check off a requirement. How do we make it inter really interactive for these potential students? Agree. And, you know, Mike, one of the benefits to this, uh, the, the university level application of this, it allows a student even to play with what happens if I change my major? You know, I mean, my, my own personal real life case, when I hit organic chemistry and said, oh, wait, maybe I don't want to go to med school anymore. What is this going to look like for me to, to be able to play with that? Um, to play with real life choices about like, well, what does it really look like if I do move to Nashville or to Chicago versus staying at home in Sevierville? Or those are the, t I think those are real life use cases that, like you said, keep it from just being a, a you know, something on the shelf.
Well, I'll add uh, another dimension here that struck me and like you and then Travis both to react to this. One of the frustrations I had when I was uh, in Pennsylvania was that high school counselors had in our area anywhere between 600 and 1,000 students that they were supposed to be counseling, yeah. which meant they weren't doing any counseling at all. And what I have picked up from this is if I could possibly have persuaded high school students to have that XP app in hand and it showed them what the opportunities are and how all of this comes in play, I have simplified that counselor's orientation to each one of these students because now you're just helping them refine the decisions they went through in putting all of those data in front of them, in front of themselves and making decisions about it. But one of the questions that it responds to is, okay, here is the difference between the level of education you choose in terms of your lifelong uh, career uh, opportunities. And right now, high schools are making those as basically bulk choices. That is, you have to make a decision, you're gonna take a vocational route or you're gonna take a higher education route. And those decisions are independent of the student having or in, and his or her family, any way of analyzing what the consequences of making that decision that early on is. Now, I, I said a lot there, but he- I think, I think you're absolutely right, Bob. I mean, I think there are a couple of foundational things that are, sometimes get lost. It begins to give students a language and an expectation. So even talking to them about the skills and helping them think about what they're already doing and already capable of, based on, in, you know, or in terms of skills, then you can also show where the gaps are and you can show the pathways. Um, so I think you're right. It gives part of that conversation can then even happen based on a shared set of of language and understanding. Oh, you don't know how important that is. I, I'm, you know, and everybody on this call knows that I work uh, on a regular basis helping people improve their resume. People who are in their 50s and 60s. And every day that I do that, I help someone identify a skill set they've got that they did not acknowledge for themselves. So it's not, it's just not junior high and high school kids who and the instant gratification of answering those surveys and saying, you mean I've got these skills? Well, that's, that's inspiring. I mean, that's motivation. That uh, helps reinforce for the person uh, th that they're accomplishing something and then seek other opportunities from them. Absolutely. In, in the same way, I mean, we all know, look, I, you know, my, my personal recent story is here I am, I have a PhD in higher education, and I can't compare the award letters of my goddaughter and tell her what her bottom line is. Like, that, that to me is highly problematic, right? And then you get into these complex decisions about, like, what is good debt and what you know opportunity costs and roi i mean those are those are just conversations that are hard to even start with but when you can lay it out and say look you know yeah you, you're going to invest some time and some money here but look what your life is going to look like when you're 30 if you do choose to pursue this degree um, i think that that creates a very different conversation I wanted to react to something else that Dr. Smith said that I found insightful and is worth calling out. And that was the increase in productivity that comes from these applications. I mean, oftentimes when people are building or using technology to build apps, they think, ah, oh, this is going to solve everything. If I just build this app and we've come to realize that 
an application is not necessarily going to solve everything. You only can do but so much, and it can only achieve but so much. And so if we can set a goal and move someone forward or bump them to the next step in the road, then we've been successful. And so that's the approach we've taken. And, and so to sum that up, we just really see these as uh, I, I, tools or methods to increase productivity across um, everyone, the student, counselors, parents, and, and that's important. Well, I, I will just offer, I mean, we've, we've laid out some of what, what we're doing, how we're thinking about things. Um, the other piece is that um, we're technology partners, right? So if you have questions or ideas or want, um, you know, someone in the room to kick these things around with, please reach out, reach out, find me. Um, this is exactly what I wanted to be doing, right? I wanted to, to open up some new opportunities for these big messy challenges. And so, um, like I said, I'm very much learning, but, um, but it's been fun and I see all kinds of opportunity here. Lauren, can I ask a quick question about the app? And you guys may have covered it when I stepped away, but um, how, how did the name come about? What does XP mean? And is there, um, are there any plans to include personality uh, results as part of the app um, as an extra layer of information for students? I guess I can take that. So uh, XP came from the concept of connected pathways or exponential pathways. Um, so the, these concepts led to the, the, the word XP, uh, also exponential potential. Uh, so it's, it's shortened on purpose to, for Gen Z specifically to sound like a game. It's also relating to the idea of, you know, in games, people play video games these days, uh, you, you have to increase your XP to advance your character. And so we, we're, we're communicating that same idea to the students that you need to increase your skills and your skill set to progress yourself. Uh, so it's sort of play on all of that. And to answer your question about personality, uh, absolutely. What we're building right now is for the Department of Education to be released free nationally. Uh, there's a localized version of this that we're that comes on the tails of this, which is would be uh, a paid app for local uh, specific problems or situations um, that a local group want to solve. And so the MVP and the free version just has an interest survey. I believe it's the Holland interest survey um, because we're under a time crunch to have that done by July. But we also have concepts for Myers Briggs and other personality surveys uh, to give the user. A holistic view of themselves. But you got to understand with Gen Z, they're just not going to go through step one, now take Myers Briggs. Step two, they want to be able to choose and make that decision themselves. They don't want to be forced into a long survey. So we have to craftily design that. Thank you. Very helpful. I don't think you can underestimate in the power of these uh, tools, the re use of real-time data. <laughs> and particularly as we sit here in 2021, not fully aware of how much job shifting and redesign of jobs has occurred in 2020. I mean, I read every day in trade publications in the business sector a lot of concern about how people adapted in 2020 and have no plans of changing some of those adaptations to return to normal. Right. So um, do you want to talk about the power of that real-time data and what the implications may be? Because you really have a possibility here that as the person goes through, one of the unintended consequences is that the skills for the job they're pursuing will shift during their four years in college. Actually, may I take that 
Lauren. Yes. <laughs> so, um, because there's a really good use case here that I want to explain, and that's the portability of skills transcript. The next step that we're working on here with George Mason, I think it, it may indirectly answer, it may directly answer Dr. Smith. So I, I think it'll be satisfying though. Um, we have a blockchain concept that we're going to introduce so that every skill that you earn is signed by the university as a trusted skill that's been evaluated. And that student then has agency over their skill and their credentials, which they don't have today. With that agency, you can then um, release your information to whom you wish, so an employer or a market, where people can scan your skills and understand what you offer them. And it may open up other opportunities for you. But looking, but looking back, by giving access to your record to the university, the university then can look at the skills that you're gaining or continuing to gain post-graduation and they can understand that, hey, what I see going on with your record and your skill set is that your skills are declining according to the job market or the job market has changed. And so we actually can help you. So I'm going to nudge you and say, hey, here's a micro credential or a course you can take on the weekend that will increase your skill sets and help you maintain your earnings potential or increase your earnings potential. And so we're seeing this as a participation between the, the learner, the university and the workforce and something like blockchain would bring that together. But the other thing I wanna state about that is the case for equity with blockchain, which we really believe in because you know before someone who maybe couldn't afford to finish or had circumstances that caused them not to finish a credential, instead of just saying, I have some college courses and that limiting their uh, potential in the workforce can now have trusted signed skills by the institution of the courses they did complete. And that makes them more marketable than just some college courses. And so I, I think, does that sort of answer your question in a roundabout way or in a satisfying manner? Yeah, I wasn't looking for a definitive answer. I just thought that it is an element worthy of discussion. In fact, you prompted another dimension of this. You're talking about this entirely from the student's point of view. And then when you said, well, I can see that your skills are, are not keeping pace with the changes that are occurring in that career, shouldn't we be having that same conversation with the faculty? I see your curriculum is not keeping pace with the changes that are happening within that discipline? Absolutely, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I'm meeting with a group of faculty today to conduct a design thinking session to talk about how they view their courses in terms of the workforce and the relevancy. So what you're saying there is absolutely true and it's a tough conversation to have. So blockchain is very interesting technology. And so you're, you're betting on global acceptance of blockchain going forward? I'm not going to sound um, like I know the answer. Um, I'm with you on that. We're also skeptical. Um, there's numerous challenges with that. You know, number one is what standard are we going to use? It's like the VHS or beta. Whose blockchain are we yeah. going to use? <laughs> We're, you know, I mean, so we have that problem, right? Um, there's, there's numerous challenges to solve there. So the way we approach that is instead of investing millions of dollars uh, let's just, what is the most minimum amount of money that we can do to create a test to see if this is valuable or not? And then based on what we learn from that, let's decide if we want to continue funding or pivot where we're moving with that. So. So it's really testing the market in some ways, right? And then seeing where it goes as, as technology evolves and as acceptance evolves. Absolutely. And if you've ever read The Lean Startup, it's a great book. And those are the principles that really underline our DNA at our, at our company. And so we bring that to higher education, which is sort of unique. Um, but uh, administrators in higher ed are actually really liking that. They're like, oh, this is kind of nice. I don't have to, you know, do this long procurement and all this money. You know, we can, we can test things on a budget. Well, sort of speaking off the cuff, I mean, at some point, university is going to have to make a decision where they accept cryptocurrency at some point. You know, we're just not <laughs> there yet. But I mean, long term, I mean, we got to be thinking differently as well. So very interesting that you mentioned blockchain just triggered something in my mind. That I just couldn't help but ask. It always triggers someone in some way, shape, or form or another. <laughs> But Bob, going back to your question and answering it in a different way, I mean, the advantage kind of connecting some of these dots it, to using the live data is that, yes, it's running on MC data, 
So if those skill sets or jobs are falling out, your app your is is updating as well, right? So you're right. It's it's not oh well my my catalog from 1997 mm -hmm. said X and these are the careers. Wait a minute, that doesn't even exist anymore. You're you're not even that's that's not memorialized in that way. Well, I see lots of advantages. Um, don't mean to monopolize, but this is really, really exciting stuff. One of the areas that of the institution, historical, traditional areas, that is really fe feeling left out of all of this are the liberal arts. And part of that problem is the liberal arts have, and having been a dean of arts and sciences, I'm going to take a little liberty to criticize my, my, my own domain here, but have done very, very little to demonstrate the skills and the transportable uh, benefits of having uh, a degree in the arts and sciences. And one of the stories I've told is about my own family. My, both of my children graduated with a degree in the liberal arts. My son was a philosophy major, eventually graduated as a communication major, and my daughter graduated as a history uh, and, on, and close to political science. And both of them are now working in fields. In fact, they, they've been in the field for a long time. So I can actually go back and say, both of them wound up in early jobs in their careers, in careers that didn't exist when they started college. But because of the general nature of what happens in a liberal education, uh, they were able to adapt. We don't articulate that well within our institution. I agree. And Bob, it jumps out at me that if you look at one of these skills roadmaps, you know, yes, there are some technical elements, but a lot of them are not. A lot of them are those transferable skills, those gen ed, things that you learn in those gen ed courses. Just the ability to write and to communicate effectively orally, those, you have a, a, a different set of experiences when you're in college than you do when you're just on a job, only working with people that I'll speak the same language that you do. Absolutely. Hey, um, may I clarify, uh, Dr. Taylor asked about in the chat, and I just want to clarify this for the group. The group may be interested in this. Um, so XP is developed under the Department of Education grant, and we're de developing it with the Council, uh, Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, CALE. And it will be released in July, what you saw today. Uh, that won't include the the dedicated mentoring, live mentoring aspect. That's something we're building with a group called the Mentoring Method, and that will be in the localized version. The app that you saw today will have national data, um, but what we're looking to do is partner with some local organizations who can then, uh, we can work with mentors and um, we can target the application for a specific group at a local, a local area. Um, what that means is the data becomes more localized, the jobs, the occupations, the pathways become more localized, um, specific for the area or the regions that, that, we're, that we're trying to serve. But most importantly is we're building something called the experience registry. And what that does is allow uh, after school clubs, summer camps, or any type of organization that wants to participate locally to enter in their experiences that they're offering and then we're going to deconstruct those experiences into skills. So that may just be summer camp. Uh, that may be a school, a, a, a free community college, tuition free community college class. Uh, that could be anything that 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 local group who's purchased the application wants to structure. And then we're going to take those experiences and help nudge the user of XP along uh, particular pathways, particular local pathways. Um, so that's, that's the plan for that, um, if anybody has any questions. I hope that answers Dr. Taylor. 
Thank you. You did. We're at a point to wrap up here. So I'm going to ask uh, Travis and Lauren to summarize what uh, you want us to have as the key takeaways from the session that you just enjoy. Sure. From, from my end, I know what the questions I had sitting in your seat just a couple of months ago and and frankly didn't have a way to answer, right? You couldn't just go to Google and say, find me a tool that. Um, and that's, so that's the, the introduction. Um, if these are things, these, whether these specific tools are appealing to you, um, we're happy to talk about what partnership might look like. Most of these, the development, the heavy lift financially has happened because of grant funds. Um, depending on what your use is, it may be plug and play, or it may be that to configure it specifically, there is some cost, but again, most of that has been largely subsidized. Um, the second piece is, you know, problem solving. I, I want to figure out ways that we can use this data and technology. Nobody wants it to sit on a shelf. So if you are looking for partners, thought partners or otherwise, that, I mean, that's, that's just sort of my offer on the table. Um, this is what I care about. Travis, you, you want to top me? <laughs> I, I can't. Uh, I can't, Lauren. <laughs> so whoever, I just want to say whoever gave us Lauren has given me my new favorite coworkers. So thank you to this group. <laughs> so. Also known as the thorn in his side sometimes, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate the opportunity and, you know, hope that this is the first of, of ongoing conversations with those here and those who are not. So some of whom we've, we've reached out to uh, individually as well. Well, thank you to both thank of you. you. This is really, really exciting. And for anybody who is engaged in strategic planning within their institution, they've got to be thinking further out in the horizon than I think we currently are. I think most people are just thinking, how am I going to get started in fall? And uh, there is an opportunity between now and fall to take a concept like this and have it in place and put that in and have something that for families and for students uh, can be very, very responsive. We know that the whole concept of student recruitment is rapidly changing. Uh, a lot of factors associated with it. Everybody's looking for an edge. Here is not only an edge, but it is also a desperately needed service and benefit to families and to the students that uh, we ask to uh, come under our care. So, Travis, Lauren, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us, Bob.